Neuroscience has become a national level priority across the globe. There are now seven existing and emerging brain projects and they've all created their own neuroethics efforts. And the reason they do that is because neuroscience carries with it assumptions and deep meaning unlike any other organ of exploration. So what that means also is that each of the countries where this happens has a variety of assumptions and meanings of what they think science should be like, how it should be conducted, and ultimately where the product should be disseminated. As a neurologist, I think that in Alzheimer's disease and other cognitive disorders, there's a number of really classic ethical problems that the field has been facing for a long time. One of the famous ones has to do with how to think about patients' values and personalities as they change over time. So for example, we have advanced directives and they're an important part of clinical care and research. But we also know that things may change in the patient's brain between when they make an advanced directive and when a particular research or clinical invention might come into play. So there's a fascinating literature about whether the person who signed some advanced directive should really be considered the same person uh, if they've been changed by a brain disease uh, as the person you know, later on in time. Yeah, so I think some of the most interesting research questions that, uh, that we can handle in the, as far as the brain initiative are sort of focused around some of the issues of, of public perception of science. You know, what is it that we support? What is it that we're doing? Why is it that we're doing these sort of things? Particularly with, brain, with the brain initiative where we're sort of pushing the envelope on some really cutting edge type technologies and how do you use them um, not just for the benefit of the patient but for society at, at large and I think you know, if you, if you pause for a moment and think about some of these technologies, we have intended uses for them, but then there are potential other uses that might be used for, for a number of other um, entities or agencies. Um, and then there's the private side as well. So I think being thoughtful in, in how scientists think about these things, how the public perceives these sort of things, um, and where they potentially could go, I think is a really important issue for, um, for people to think about. A lot of law is based on uh, folk psychological understandings of the brain. Um, for example, in criminal law, we assume that people have the capacity to do things voluntarily, that they do things with particular mental states. Um, and neuroscience may challenge that. The more we learn and understand about the human brain, the more we understand that many um, actions may not be completely volitional, many actions may not be uh, with the same kind of mental state that we would need for the kinds of criminal culpability we talk about. But it's expansive, all of the issues and all the ways in which neuroscience is touching the legal system from our tort law conceptions of how we show whether or not a person is in pain to forensic applications to try to see if a person is lying or telling the truth um, to eyewitness uh, memory and trying to reconstruct and understand what people are um, remembering, how accurate memory is. Neuroscience is challenging all of that, which is both terrific but also requires that we rethink a lot of what we're doing in neuroscience.